started with our introduction. Um, this is the Organic Yard Care and Lawn Alternative webinar. So we have two speakers today, um, and then there will be a question and answer sec uh, section for them to answer any questions that you all have. My name is Erin Landis. I am the River Friendly Program Coordinator at the Watershed Institute. Um, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the River Friendly Program. It is a um, recognition program to encourage folks to um, improve their environmental stewardship of the land. So um, the River Friendly Program is run by three partners, the Watershed Institute, Raritan Headwaters and New Jersey Water Supply Authority. And that map on the right shows the general area that we work in, which is the um, Raritan watershed. The upper Raritan is in pink there, low in green, and that yellow area is the Millstone watershed. The River Friendly Program um, works with um, different types of organizations, so specifically businesses, golf courses, schools, and also residents or individuals. We also have a community partner program for anyone that doesn't fall into those first four categories. This is our website. If you're interested in learning more about the River Friendly Program, please check it out. It is njriverfriendly.org. Um, and our contact information is on there. You can always reach out with questions. This webinar is being recorded and um, within a day or two, it's gonna be posted on this resources page on the River Friendly website. Um, so check this out here. We're gonna have the recording posted as well as additional resources for you. We do have a few more um, webinars planned in the upcoming weeks. On May 14th, we're having one on organic pest management for the home garden. Um, and they're also gonna cover plant this, not that, which is essentially native um, plants to, to install in your landscaping instead of common invasive or non-native species that we see in a lot of yards. So again, all these webinars are free and they each start at noon. On May 20th, we have one on harmful algal blooms and aquatic invasive species. Um, and that one is also over lunchtime. Just a few technical tips. Um, first of all, if everyone could mute themselves throughout the presentations, it really helps with background noise. Um, so that is much appreciated. If you are having difficulties with your um, connection or with hearing things, if you mouse down on your screen, um, this toolbar will pop up at the bottom. And if you click on the round button with three little um, dots on it, there's an option for audio connection. And if you click on that, you can actually type in your phone number here um, and you'll receive a call through WebEx that will um, allow you to hear the webinar. So that's another way that you can um, link into this webinar. In that same toolbar, you're able to mute yourself. Um, and you can also message us through that little chat button. And that's how we ask you, um, we would like the participants to ask questions through the chat box. So as the presenters are presenting, you can um, ask any questions and we'll get to them at the end of the presentation. So our two presenters today are Bob Shin from um, Save a Tree. And secondly, we're gonna have Karen Walzer from Jersey Friendly Yards. So we are super excited to have him speak to us today. And I think I'm gonna turn it over to Bob. Thanks for coming, everyone. She's trying to find Bob's name. <laughs> okay, change rules, sending it to Bob, okay. Unmute. Can everyone hear me okay now? Yep. Oh, perfect. All right, so let me pull this up. Um, first off, I'd like to 
Uh, thanks, Aaron and Kyle, for inviting me uh, today to talk to everyone about the organic lawn care options. Um, I'm, I'm going to really dive into the next couple slides. Um, you know, what exactly is some lawn care, uh, organically speaking, and go over some other tips. Um, quickly, though, a little bit about myself. Uh, as Aaron mentioned, my name is Bob Shin. I'm the lawn care manager for Save a Tree in New Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. I've been with Save a Tree for a little over 10 years now after previously working in sports fields. Um, so yeah, I've, part of my role is helping develop uh, all of our programs in New Jersey and Pennsylvania, um, specifically today talking about the organic side of things. Hey, Bob. Yes. Um, we cannot yet see your PowerPoint. Oh, okay. Let me see if I, I, think I can. Yeah, at the bottom of your screen, there's a button that shows like an arrow kind of pointing up. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Aaron. I forgot that step. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Perfect. We can see it now. Are we good? Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, the topics I want to cover in the next 25, 30 minutes or so. Uh, what exactly is organic lawn care um, or organic pest management, some different options uh, that you might have as a homeowner. To water or not to water, that is the question. Obviously dealing with, uh, you know, watersheds and everything, that's really important to understand the effect of your irrigation practices and whatever type of lawn or plant program that you have going on to lessen the impacts that we have on our water bodies. I also really want to spend some time on cultural practices uh, besides irrigation. Um, so yeah, I'll jump right into it. And uh, if you have any questions, as Aaron said, we can uh, address them at the end. All right, so what is organic lawn care exactly? Um, it's really a culture switch, okay? It's not necessarily just switching the types of products or fertilizers that you're using on your lawn. There's lots of other things that go hand in hand, which is why later in the presentation, I really want to dive deep into some of the beneficial cultural practices that you can do because they go hand in hand with organic lawn care. <clears throat> like any plant management, uh, two items are key. Obviously the health of your soil, because that's where your plant's growing, and making sure you're putting the right plant in the right place. Just like you would, you know, putting in any ornamental shrubs or plants, selecting the right grasses plays a key role in developing a nice healthy lawn. The major differences between organic and I put traditional lawn care in quotes here um, is what they're made of, your thresholds and expectations and the importance of correct cultural practices. And I, I put the traditional lawn care in quotes because that's, you know, what we've come accustomed to seeing is all the synthetic products that have been on the market for so long. And while organics have been around, it, from talking to clients and other people in the industry, it almost, there's almost a new sense to these type of products. And they're coming out with new, improved products every day for this type of work. So I'm going to start with your soil health. Um, so before you start any type of lawn maintenance program, you have to get a soil test. This is basically your lawn's blood test. Just like when you see a doctor, if, if you want to get to the root cause of what might be going on, you have to get a blood test done. And pictured here is just a sample uh, of, of, one of the, one of my client's um, soil test results. And a company like myself, we send them out to a lab, we analyze everything, and we get these back and we'll communicate them with, with our clients. Uh, as a homeowner, you can go through Rutgers. I know a lot of their, uh, their, their county extension offices can get you materials to get a soil test done. The basic items that I'm looking at right off the bat with a soil test is your soil pH. All right, you can see in this result, it's, it comes in at a 6.4, which is optimum for, for a cool season lawn. The next thing I'm looking at are the macronutrients. And by macronutrients, I'm talking about the phosphorus and the potassium. Those normally, when you look at a fertilizer bag, you see that ratio on the front, 
those are the last two numbers. With your normal soil test, you won't get a reading for nitrogen, basically because it's so mobile within the environment in the soil, you can never really get an accurate reading on that number because the plant's utilizing it consistently as it's growing. So we really want to look at the phosphorus and potassium levels, and then I also want to check out the organic matter content in the soil because that really helps drive you know, a lot of the soil microbiology that's going on. Then you can also start to analyze some of the micronutrients such as your magnesium, calcium, and iron, for example. After we get a sense of where the levels are in your soil, you want to make sure you're planting the right grass in the right area, right? Because a lot of times when I talk to folks, they think, oh, grass is just grass, right? It's not all the same. There's different varieties and different cultivars of grass within those varieties. Typically in the Northeast, we're predominantly dealing with cool season turf grasses, uh, such as Kentucky bluegrass, rye grasses, tall fescues, and fine fescues. Every once in a while, you might have a, a zoysia grass lawn. That's a warm season turf. Um, so right now, it's just starting to wake up, whereas other, uh, other lawns are nice and green. They popped out of dormancy well. Uh, a zoysia grass, I don't, while I don't have it listed here, that really starts to flourish a lot in the summertime because it likes the warmer weather. So these next few slides, I want to run through some of the uh, advantages and some disadvantages, you might say, of some of the different cool season grasses. So our Kentucky bluegrass, right, that's the, uh, that's the baseball field grass. When you're watching a baseball game on TV, majority of professional sports fields, they play on Kentucky bluegrass because it can withstand a low mowing height. And this is the turf that gives you a nice, really deep, dark green color. It has great traffic tolerance. Um, the downsides to it, it does require more nitrogen to keep it healthy and some more. Uh, as you can see, my the second bullet point, there's a, it says the, this plant has rhizomes. So it can creep and produce daughter plants. And that also um, requires more cultural practice, such as core aeration and dethatching, because that, those rhizomes can create a, a pretty significant thatch layer in the lawn. This plant also requires slightly more water. And the seed can take longer to germinate, sometimes in some instances up to 21 days. Next up is some ryegrasses. Um, normally, you're either looking at a perennial, perennial or an annual ryegrass. Um, you'll typically use the annual ryegrasses in an overseeding situation where uh, you want some grass to establish quickly to help protect the desirable seeds while they're still growing in. Um, one of the advantages, like I mentioned, it is a quick germinator. It can germinate in as low as seven days. So within a week, you'll have some baby grass plants growing. Um, it is a bunch type, so it won't creep and fill in areas like a bluegrass will, and it doesn't have that really dark green color. Uh, it also uses much more water compared to other turf grass varieties. Um, nitrogen use, same as the Kentucky bluegrasses. So these two, types of grasses, your Kentucky bluegrass, I'll skip back for a second, and your, and your ryegrasses, for them to stay nice and lush and healthy, you're looking at applying three and a half to sometimes four pounds of nitrogen per season to a thousand square foot area, okay? And you'll see the difference in our tall fescue varieties. This is another bunch type of grass. Traditionally, the tall fescues have been really, really big, thick bladed grasses. Sometimes they look a little ugly. I actually have some clients that get them confused with weeds. They think it's crabgrass or something invading their lawn. But a lot of the newer varieties that have been come out through research, um, they're smaller, more compact varieties, and they, they look fantastic in a lawn. They have great wear tolerance, 
and they require less nitrogen compared to your bluegrasses and ryes. Um, whereas a, a bluegrass or a rye, like I mentioned, could take up to three and a half pounds of that nitrogen per year, a, a tall fescue could get away with as little as two and a half pounds. It also uses a lot less water compared to the other two grasses, uh, and it can survive drought conditions much better than those two other grasses. This last one I wanted to touch on briefly is uh, your fine fescues. There's lots of different cultivars in the, in the fine fescue group, hard fescues, chewings fescues, creeping red fescues. These grasses do fantastic in densely shaded areas. Similar to the tall fescue, it has lower nitrogen needs, but it has a very low traffic tolerance. This is the, the grass that you'll see. It looks almost like a really thin needle and it doesn't require as much sunlight as, uh, as your Kentucky bluegrass or ryegrass does. That's, that's why it can perform very well in a, in a shaded situation. As pictured on the, on the screen here, you can see lots of canopy cover from some trees, and it gets that really wispy look to it and can, and can do very well in these type of conditions. All right, so after we look at our grasses and we try to pick the right ones that fit into our landscape, then we can start looking at some organic pest management options. Uh, just to touch on that seed selection real quick and your plant selection, you might use different varieties throughout your lawn. Uh, one thing that we do at Save a Tree when we're seeding a client's lawn we, we use sometimes up to three or four different blends of seed to put the correct plant in the correct place. And it's the same thing you can do with your property. Make sure you're choosing the right seed blends to match the locations on your property because every property is going to be set up a little bit differently. All right, so organic pest management. It's all about setting your own personal threshold. What is acceptable? acceptable to you because I can guarantee you there will be weeds, there will be insects, and there will be disease issues. Even in a, in a fully synthetic program, as you can see in this picture here uh, next to my, my wife's Chuck Taylor's, you can see that little patch of clover. Uh, and I snapped this picture from a, a professional stadium uh, right outside of Philly. So on a, on a stadium and a, and a plot of turf that's been managed on a daily basis, they still have weed issues. And when you're looking into the organic options, you're going to have them just the same. The best way to reduce the, the, the pest damage in your turf is obviously to have a healthy plant. The healthier your soil is and the healthier your plants can become, the more tolerant they are to pressures from whether from insects, disease, and, and invasive weeds. The key is matching your grass types and the fertility program that those grass types need. You don't want to overfeed them. You know, as I mentioned, the, the bluegrass and the tall fescues require different amounts of nitrogen throughout the year, so you'd fertilize them differently. Um, especially in shaded areas. You don't want to just grab a bag of fertilizer, read the label, set it to the setting, and do it all the same. In the shaded areas, you might want to put down less or sometimes skip an application and only treat the sunny areas of your lawn with a fertilizer just to maintain a nice even level of, of uh, fertility throughout the growing season and give the plant what it needs and not more. But a lot of times what can happen if you over fertilize in a shaded area, the plant basically gets too big for itself. It produces that nitrogen will, will, will trigger the plant to start overproducing leaf vegetation and the root system can't support it. So it ends up basically overfeeding itself and it, it will start to thin out on you. Most of the organic fertilizers on the market come as a granular product, so you, you spread them and you'll need to water them in after, after the application. 
Uh, they usually contain less nitrogen than a synthetic product. Uh, when you look at most synthetic products that are on the market, um, you know, your straight urea product usually has an analysis of a 3600. Uh, most of your organics products range as low as, you know, maybe 500 or, or as upwards as maybe 15. Um, really, it all depends on what your plant needs. Look at the ratio on the bag and look at the, the label itself because that gives you a lot of information on how to apply the material appropriately. Your timing of applications. Um, what you want to avoid is basically sending your plant into a roller coaster of soil fertility. You want to use these organic slow release products to try to make a nice even, even line, for lack of a better word, of fertility in the soil so they can maintain a nice constant state of growth. Um, one thing that we do at Save a Tree, we try to keep our fer fertilizer applications on right around a 45 day interval. Um, it might be less in your landscape or it might be more depending on, like I said, those different grass varieties. One thing you also have to keep in mind with the timing of fertilizer applications is the weather. Obviously, you don't want to apply a product before a heavy thunderstorm. Um, in fact, it's, it's against the law in New Jersey now. <laughs> but your, your main objective is to put down the fertilizer and reduce the risk of runoff or leaching. That's why we won't want to, you wouldn't want to apply those products before a large rain event. A little bit of rain is great to water in the product, get it down into the soil, into the root zone so it's available to the plant, but you really want to avoid uh, and, and probably delay an application if you're expecting, you know, a heavy thunderstorm, an inch or two more rain over, over the course of a couple days. Also in the summertime, when the plants naturally want to go dormant, and you know it's a natural process that the plant's going to go through. It shuts down to protect itself from the heat. You can avoid you can avoid fertilizing in those times because the plant isn't going to actively need the nutrient. All right, some organic pest management practices. Uh, obviously, the most organic way to remove a pest is to physically remove it. Um, you know, lots of times in, in weed situations, you know, obviously pulling the weeds out is as organic as you can get. Um, but there are some other options um, listed below are some active ingredients that are in um, organic products that are on the market now that work well for both weeds and some of them such as the eugenol work well for insects. Um, one of the grub control products that we use contains a eugenol in it. Uh, which helps uh, control white grubs in a lawn. Uh, I know Kyle had forwarded me a question earlier today that someone brought up about nematodes uh, and using nematodes to control white grubs in the lawn. Uh, the research I've read on that um, is, is, is somewhat back and forth, uh, but most of the university data shows that you need to, to make sure you're doing those applications with a nematode uh, when, when the grubs are active. Um, so once again, have that threshold set up. You know, usually if I'm seeing more than 10 grubs in a one square foot area, that could be, potentially be a problem. So the key with nematodes, the grubs have to be active at the time of application and you need to water them because the nematodes survive in the soil water. So when you're doing the application, order your product, apply it right away because there are living, living soil microbes. That's what nematodes are. And you have to water your lawn first to have adequate soil moisture, apply the nematode solution, and then water it again at least a quarter inch of irrigation to get that product down to the root zone where the grubs are actively feeding. Talking a little bit more about some of these other products, um, your corn gluten, uh, that's one that's used mostly as a crabgrass pre-emergent. Um, 
the products that we've been using in the past, um, the way it works with a crabgrass control is a crabgrass seed is a little bit different than your desirable grass seeds in, in that a crabgrass seed has tiny little hairs on the seed itself. And what the corn gluten actually does is it burns off those little hairs to prevent that seed from germinating. So it's really important that you time these applications early in the spring before that seed germinates for it to be effective. And also water it in. Uh, you'll see that's a key with a lot, of, a lot of your fertilizer products to water that product in and get it available to the plant. Don't expect the same immediate results as a synthetic product. Um, especially with corn gluten and many of these other products, um, it's, it's, a, it's an over time accumulation. You know, it's not a one and done um, magic product in a bag that you're gonna put down and you're gonna be fine. Uh, lots of times the organic products work a little bit slower. Um, you don't see that immediate, you know, four to seven days after a treatment, you know, the weed starts curling it takes a little bit longer, and, and retreatments are absolutely necessary. All right, so let's jump into irrigation practices. Most of your turf needs a minimum of one inch of water per week, um, and a great way to audit that is to take a tuna fish can and set it in your lawn if you have an irrigation system. And that way you can see if you're filling up that tuna fish can, because I believe that's about a quarter inch of water, if, it's, if you're collecting that much, you're, you're doing a good job with your irrigation zones and your timing. You wanna make sure that you're running your irrigation early in the morning, avoid watering in the evening um, because our goal is to reduce that length of leaf wetness. Um, that's crucial in minimizing the pressure of diseases. Uh, most of our turf diseases in residential uh, lawns are caused by fungi, and fungi need a nice wet environment to start growing. Um, a majority of them are obviously water and temperature dependent, so the, the less we can keep the leaf wet, the better off we're gonna be at controlling diseases. So you wanna water infrequently and deep. I'd rather see a client water twice a week for 40 minutes each, each zone, rather than every day for 10 minutes a zone. You're getting the water deeper into the soil profile. Your turf roots are actively searching for that water, growing deeper instead of hanging out in that top inch or two of soil um, because that's where the water is. The more we can get the roots to drive down deeper, searching for water, the healthier your plant's gonna be. When you look at turf growth, there's a direct correlation between root growth and top growth. The longer and deeper your roots are, the healthier that plant's gonna be because it's growing down deeper in the soil, searching for water and finding other nutrients that are stuck in the soil. Uh, I also put a little note in here about wetting agents. Um, they are fantastic tools for managing your water usage. Um, we typically apply that type of product in June, right before summer sets in and what it basically does, <laughs> for lack of a better better phrase is it makes water wetter, okay? It helps even out how that water soaks in through your soil profile and it helps the soil hold on to that water when it needs to, okay? And it makes your, makes it more available to the plant. Um, you, all, you, you all probably noticed that some areas of your lawn dry out a little bit faster than others. That's the whole goal of a wetting agent, is to try to even out the water usage in your, in your soil uh, profile. All right, this slide. Uh, I, I always show this to, uh, to some of my specialists, and, 
and other folks that, that really think about irrigation and, oh, does it really matter? Um, this was actually a client of mine. I went out to diagnose something because he, you know, there's obvious turf injury here. And at first glance, it think, you would think it's just mower damage, right? This was in a hot summer day, you know, the stress from the mowing causing the, the striping. But when you kind of look at it, let me see if I can mouse over. You know, there's all these tan lines, but then in here, there's really, it's really not that noticeable. What I found out was the real problem, it wasn't a disease, it wasn't an insect, it wasn't really the mower. The client's irrigation system, the heads weren't rotating all the way. So you'd have a green band, another green band, and wherever there was getting water, the turf was nice and healthy and wasn't stressed out by the mowing. Um, and that goes hand in hand with, with regularly auditing your irrigation system. Uh, sometimes you don't notice that a head's spinning the right way or it might be putting out too much water or too little water. So it's very important that you, you always check up and make sure that your irrigation system's running correctly. Um, this website is a great tool. Um, I use it regularly. Um, I think I sent this link to Aaron and Kyle, uh, so you, they'll, they'll send it out to everyone later. Um, but this is real simple, easy to use um, website. You know, all you have to do is enter in your zip code and the, the other couple fields right there, and it'll basically tell you how much you need to water your lawn for that week and if you need to water at all. Uh, it's fantastic, super easy to use, uh, and it's, and like I said, it's great for a homeowner, just a, a quick, easy glance at how much you, you'll need to water your lawn. All right, some other cultural practices uh, I wanted to talk briefly about. Soil amendments, uh, liming, gypsum, and organic matter. Uh, liming, when, when you're looking to apply lime, that's, that's coming directly from your soil test. Um, lime's used to raise the, the pH of the soil uh, and get it right into that optimum uh, 6.3 to 6.7 zone. Um, in, in that zone, most of your nutrients are going to be available to your grass plant. Uh, once you start dropping lower or, or going above that, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the nutrients tend to get bound up in the soil and then they're not uh, easily accessible by the plant. Uh, you might want to do a gypsum application if your pH comes back too high. We would use a product like that to bring it down into that zone. Um, you can also use either gypsum or sulfur um, if you have salt damage. Um, we typically see that, you know, right coming right out of winter um, when there's salt applied along sidewalks or along roadways. Um, that sulfur application will help draw the salt out of solution in the soil and help it flush out through the soil profile. Um, organic matter, uh, you know, leaf mulch top dressings and also cumates um, are fantastic tools to help remedy uh, a property for a soil profile that has uh, a lower organic matter content or a low CEC. Uh, that's the cation exchange capacity in your soil. Uh, so if I see soil tests that come back and they're low and they're deficient in those two categories, I would recommend uh, applying a humate type product um, to help correct that and help make more nutrients available to your plants. Uh, they do make uh, that product available in a granular form uh, as opposed to, you know, top dressing. But whatever fits within uh, your needs for your landscape is sufficient. Uh, cultivation. Uh, I can't stress enough, uh, for the sake of time, I didn't include too many slides about coeration, uh, but coeration is one of the most beneficial things you can do for your landscape. Um, it, it often goes on look because you can't necessarily see it on a soil test, but by coerating your lawn, you're, you're helping introduce one of the most overlooked macronutrients for your plant, and that's oxygen. The more gas exchange by opening up, creating more pore space in your soil, promoting more oxygen and gas exchange in that root system, the healthier the plant's going to be. 
especially in our area, I know there's a lot of clay soils. Uh, aerating regularly, uh, you know, sometimes twice a year or at least once a year, really helps break up and loosen that soil to give the roots a really nice place to grow. Uh, Dethatching is another thing, uh, especially really thatchy lawns, uh, your blue grasses, and if, you, and, and if you have a zoysia lawn, it can get very thatchy. Uh, every once in a while, you know, maybe not every year, uh, but every two or three years, taking one of those dethatching rakes to remove some of that will go a long way. Uh, if you're seeing, seeing thatch layers, uh, probably two inches or more, I would consider doing that as opposed to a core aeration. Uh, mowing, uh, I'm going to get into this because mowing is one of the biggest factors that can impact your plant health. Um, I do have a couple slides on this, but uh, when we speak to homeowners and, and the way my company operates, the two most major things that are out of our control uh, is the irrigation, which we just touched on, and the mowing. And mowing can totally impact your, your, your grass health. Um, I want to actually credit this slide um, to my old professor, Dr. Doug Lindy. Um, he's the professor of turf grass science at Delaware Valley University. Uh, I was lucky enough for him to let me uh, borrow these couple slides from. He was on a sabbatical in New Zealand studying golf greens, and uh, you can't get much more organic than this uh, mowing your grass. Um, they actually have sheep, herds of sheep, that would feed, you know, eat, eat the rough on some of these golf courses, and that's how they maintained them. But proper mowing, are you doing it or is a landscaper doing it? Um, it's really important that if you're doing it yourself, you're making sure that you're cutting it at most three inches. Once you start dropping below three inches, the plant starts to stress out a little bit more, and you can lead to more weed infestations, and, and the plant can get stressed out faster from pests such as insects and disease. Also, follow the one-third rule. Uh, that's not removing more than a third of the leaf blade in a single mowing. Um, that's incredibly important this time of year. You know, we've been having a lot of rain. Turf is waking up. It's growing very, very fast at a rapid rate, especially now that the soil temperatures have started to jump up. Uh, in some cases, you might have to mow your lawn twice a week you know, rather than once every week. But keep in mind, in the summer, when your grass starts to shut down, it's growing a little slower, you can drop that down to maybe once every other week. Your, your, your key is to only try to remove that one-third uh, of the leaf blade at a time. Um, because you can actually scalp a plant by cutting, you know, if, if it's actively growing at about four inches and you cut it down to two, that's still scalping it. A lot of people think scalping a plant is bringing it right down to the dirt. If you're cutting into uh, the white margin of the bottom of the grass plant, that's scalping it. And that margin can sometimes grow up an inch high. Also switch up your pattern uh, so you're not going over the same turf uh, constantly in the same direction. Uh, the grass plant will actually start to lay over. That's what gives that striping effect. Um, and if it's constantly laid over in the same way, you might have your mower set at that three inches, but the grass blade is still growing four, sometimes five inches long because it's laying over. So switch up your pattern. That way you're not running over the same soil and compacting the same areas all the time. Uh, be really careful when you're string trimming. Um, a lot of times what I see, especially along curb strips, you know, we take the string trimmer, flip it on its side to give it that nice crisp edge. Um, that really impacts the amount of crabgrass pressure you can have because you're lessening the turf canopy that helps keep the soil cool and it, help, and it gets more sunlight into that soil letting crabgrass start to grow in. Uh, that's the first place I always see crabgrass starting to break through is right along edges where the string trimmer, you know, is essentially scalping all those edges. And also regularly uh, clean your equipment. 
Uh, it's very important that you're that you're maintaining everything, having a nice sharp blade, uh, so you don't have that dull, you know, kind of torn look on your grass when you're done. Uh, this slide is, I always try to include this slide when I talk about mowing. Um, once again, this is from uh, Dr. Dr. Lindy. <clears throat> all the, the lime green grass in the background there is all crabgrass, and it was directly impacted by mowing. What happened was they came in, they dropped the height of cut, brought it down. This is a soccer field because they, want, they were thinking about more about playability than the health of the plant. So when they dropped the, the height of cut, the canopy became reduced, allowed more sunlight to enter, in the, enter into the top layer of the soil, and causing all the gra crabgrass to germinate. Uh, this had nothing to do with any type of fertility program or, or, or chemical program. This was solely a function of uh, changing their mowing practices. Uh, so it directly corre correlates to the health of your plant, of your uh, property. I think I'm doing pretty decent on time. Uh, just to wrap it up, uh, organic lawn care is a is a cultural switch. It's not just switching up products and using different products. Um, it, you really need to focus in on all the all the irrigation. Uh, concerns and all the cult other cultural practices with the mowing and the aeration and seeding. Um, it, 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 it's an all-in type of thing. It's not just uh, picking a different bag of fertilizer out. Um, choose the right plant for the right situation. I can't stress that enough. Um, and establish your own thresholds. Um, make sure you're only using the products to control a pest when you need to. Um, and it's different for everybody. For some people, one dandelion is too much, but for the person down the road, they're fine with as many dandelions on their lawn as, 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 as there are. Um, and once again, water as needed, um, infrequent and deep, and, and don't be afraid of letting your turf go dormant in the summertime. It, it's a natural process that the plant goes through. Um, so don't, don't try to push it too hard uh, when, it, when you don't really have to. And lastly, the mowing matters. Uh, make sure you're on top of it and you're, you're mowing it correctly and, and just following that one-third rule. I can't stress that enough. And lastly, here's some links to uh, the Save a Tree websites about our lawn care services and just some other tips that I've shared here are also included in that second link. All right, thank you very much, uh, Bob. That was great. Um, it's about 1.43, so we're gonna take like five minutes for um, some questions that have built up, and then we'll switch over to Karen. Um, so first question for Bob. Um, something has a current mix of Kentucky and rye, mm -hmm. and they'd like to convert it to tall fescue, and how would you go about doing that? So one thing I would do, um, I, wouldn't, it, it, I wouldn't convert the entire stand to just tall fescue. Um, you really want to avoid uh, a monoculture. Um, that's when you have the same type of grass everywhere. Um, a lot of the, the, the strategies we use is to incorporate all three, you know, because some, some grasses are more susceptible to certain diseases than others. Um, so if you were to get one pest and you had a monoculture, it could potentially wipe out your entire stand of turf. Um, one thing I would, I would stress, you know, coerate and overseed with your tall fescue. That way you have a blend of the, all those different grasses in your lawn to make it healthier and, and to help resist pests. Okay, great. Um, we had a follow-up question on um, grubs. Um, I th mm -hmm. You had mentioned like a kind of 10 grub threshold and somebody was asking if it's, um, they thought that not all grubs were bad and determining between native and non-native grubs, is it, is it more of a grub threshold or is it, are you looking for? Yeah, mostly when, I, when I'm talking about that threshold, it's for uh, Japanese beetle grubs. Um, there are different species of 
because uh, a grub essentially is the larva of a beetle. Um, so there, your, your predominant grub species is going to be, you know, your Japanese beetles. Um, but there are other ones, black turf grass, itinius, um, European mass chafers. Um, but you really want to target those pests when they're active, especially with some of these organic products, um, because they don't have a long residual. Uh, the nematodes, for example, you, 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 you're going to have to do a follow-up treatment with it. You're going to have to do a minimum of two. That was in all the research that I read about that product. Um, and they have to be watered in. That's key to getting control of those. Um, and they also, um, the research I've read, those nematodes are specific to the Japanese beetles and I believe the European mass chafer uh, grubs. Um, okay, great. What about um, with the soil tests? How many like tests or samples would you suggest for a lawn? Um, do you do it for certain okay. different areas or like three per the lawn or just one per section or how do you determine? That? Yeah, when I normally take a soil test, I'll take um, usually at least 10 different plugs from around the property. Um, if you have a large, if you have a large lawn, I might do one test for the front and one test for the back. Um, or if I have a problem area, I'll do that one individually. Um, but you, I believe most, most soil tests require about a cup of soil to get an accurate reading from everything. Um, but take random samples throughout the lawn. That way you can kind of get an, a nice average. Um, but like I said, if, the, if I, if I see a problem area, I'll test that separately from the rest of the lawn. Okay. Um, and you really need to do that, um, you know, before you start your program, that way you have a baseline. And then typically for a home lawn, every three years, do a soil test. Um, after you were speaking about um, the importance of core aeration, do you treat the lawn after you aerate? Um, or or when when should you aerate and stuff, yeah. Yeah, typically, um, I like to do a lot of our aerations in the fall. Um, that way the soil temperatures, the, the, the temperatures and the atmospheric temperatures and the soil temperatures are starting to cool a little bit, so it's not as stressful on the plant. Um, and you can absolutely do a fertilizer application right with your core aeration, because it helps get that product directly into the soil. Um, Mowing is totally fine after you do uh, an aeration. I get a lot of questions about that from, from clients, uh, especially when we seed. As long as you're not bagging your clippings, mow it, mow it. you know, it's totally fine. It'll help break up all those plugs that get pulled out and, and drag those, uh, the soil particles back into the holes and loosen everything up. Okay, um, I'm gonna do two more quick questions and then we're gonna switch over. If um, you have a question that doesn't uh, that we don't have time for right now. You can feel free to email us with the follow up, um, or perhaps you can follow up directly with Bob, and we'll we can try to get you answers. Um, so one more was um, dealing with Bermuda grass. Um, somebody was talking about that in their garden. Okay, um, Bermuda uh, can be very difficult because. Uh, unlike the bluegrass how I mentioned, it creeps. Bermuda can, can creep very quickly. Um, physically removing it, and if it's getting into your garden, um, you'd really need this type of border uh, that goes down into the soil so it can't send its rhizomes and stolons through. Um, that's one strategy we actually use with uh, bamboo plants because they're incredibly invasive. You actually need to set up a physical barrier to keep the plant from encroaching into your garden bed. Um, okay, last question, and then I'm going to, um, while you're speaking, I'm going to switch the screen over to Karen. Um, somebody was looking for um, advice on any other pre-emergence to use besides um, corn gluten meal or where to get it cheaper and then similarly um, somebody who's asking for over-the-counter humates. Uh, I'll be honest I don't know where to find over-the-counter humates um, 
uh, I, I'm just honest with you, because I, I, I deal mostly with uh, national vendors. Um, corn gluten, from what I've seen, tends to work the best. Um, whenever I've gone to university trials, when they're dealing with uh, organic pre-emergence, it's a major 99% uh, of it's all corn gluten, and that seems to work the best. Okay, sounds great. Um, thank you again so much, and thanks everybody for those um, insightful questions. And I just switched it over to Karen. So, um, Karen, is everything going okay? Hopefully, you can pull it up. I just pulled it up. Can you see it? Um, give it a second. Sometimes it takes a bit of a second. Okay. If not, I'll I'll do it again. Uh, yeah, not seeing it right now. Okay, let's see what's going on. Share content. There we go. See it? Yeah, it says starting to share content, so it's loading. Excellent. There we go. Got it. All right. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Walzer. I'm the public outreach coordinator for Barnica Bay Partnership, which is one of our three national estuary programs that we have here in New Jersey. We're very lucky for being a small state to actually have three um, of the national programs. And um, as part of what we do, we we're lucky enough to get a grant from New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection uh, back in 2013 to develop a new website all about landscaping um, in order to help reduce pollution that's coming from everyone's yard, um, generally called non-point source pollution. This is actually the biggest source of pollution now in New Jersey, um, you know, now that we have regulated factories and point source pollution. The majority is now coming from our yards. Um, so the website was designed for the entire state of New Jersey because this is a statewide problem, not just a problem for the Barnicot Bay. Um, so again, the motivation behind it was clean water um, and healthier habitat for wildlife. So those are our two, two things that we like to focus on. So the website um, is really for homeowners like yourselves. Um, anyone can use it. It has some great resources, which I'm actually gonna go over during my presentation. Um, this is the URL for it, easy to remember, jerseyyardsplural.org. And here's a screenshot of the homepage. Um, a big part of the website is the use of native plants, which I'll get into. Um, and three of the really great features that you'll want to check out on the website are the eight steps to a Jersey friendly yard. And that's through the builder better a better yard uh, link and the interactive yard, which I'll talk a little bit about and the searchable plant database. So just a quick overview of the eight steps. So, um, we actually based quite a bit of this on a low maintenance. Um, guide developed by the Ocean County Soil Conservation District. And a lot of it's just common sense, actually, you know, before you plan anything, you want to you want to go out and you want to take a look at your yard and you want to plan healthy soil. Very important, not just for turf grass, but for anything in your yard. Water wisely, we want to encourage people to fertilize less, um, manage pests responsibly. And what I'm going to put focus on here is reduce lawn size and then create habitat for wildlife and then composting and other ways to reduce, reuse and recycle in your yard. So let's get right to it. Why is it important to shrink the lawn? Um, so this is a pretty extreme example, but I'm sure you've all seen yards like this, you know, huge expanses of lawn. Um, so Bob has given great, great information and tips about 
what you can do to go organic and reduce the use of fertilizers and reduce use of water, um, pesticides, proper mowing, and that all has an environmental impact, a pretty huge environmental impact, because you start adding up all of the lawns in New Jersey, and then think about the whole United States, here's the number, right? Over 40 million acres of lawn in the US. It's actually our biggest crop. Um, and the reason that it does have this huge impact is it's everywhere. And water use, for example, um, we use over 7 billion gallons of water each and every day in the United States just to irrigate lawns. Um, that's that actually about half of that gets wasted just because of inefficient watering methods. Um, Bob was talking about people who water every single day, even when it's not necessary. Improperly. Um, directed, you know, um, irrigation heads and all of that. Um, fertilizer, we actually use 10 times more fertilizer on our lawns per acre than we do on our food crops. Huge, huge use of fertilizer on lawns. Nitrogen and phosphorus that's in the fertilizer, that is now the ma major source of water pollution in New Jersey. So that's why I threw in that photo of the storm drain because this is what's happening, right? You look at this big, beautiful lawn that's you know being treated with fertilizers. Um, that in a rain um, storm, you have storm water coming off that lawn, and it's headed down that storm drain, which goes to the nearest stream or river. And for us in my water shed, that ends up in the bay. That ends up being a problem because. It will fuel excessive growth of algae and other aquatic plants that can end up resulting in something called eutrophication, um, which is a huge increase in the organic matter in that body of water. It could be your local lake. It could be your river. It could be like us, the Barnegat Bay, and that will and then lead to drops in the oxygen level in the water and potentially fish kills. And everyone, I'm sure, is aware of the harmful algal blooms that happened this past summer on Lake Copatcong and some other lakes. And that's directly related to fertilizer use on our lawns. And lawns are, are wildlife deserts. So even if you were to manage them you know, as well as you could and go organic, you still have lost that habitat for wildlife. Lawns are a monoculture. Um, you don't have a variety of plants, and you don't have plants that are actually native to our area. On the Jersey Friendly Arts website, there's a section called the Interactive Yard, and this um, is, is actually a fun thing. If I have time later, I'll show you because I am going to jump over to the website eventually. Um, but this can take you through the steps to a Jersey Friendly Yard, and you see you start out with a typical a typical yard with quite a bit of lawn, um, some plantings around the house, but um, mostly lawn. After you go through all of those steps, which I'm not gonna take the time to do today, but you go through the steps and it gives you tons of ideas about the changes you can make in your yard. And you can see that this has been transformed. And this, you know, after you've done all this, you still have lawn because lawn um, you know, does have a purpose and people do want areas of lawn in their yard for recreation, play areas, pets, uh, barbecuing, whatever. Um, so it, it keeps those areas of lawn, but it eliminates all those unused areas of lawn. If you think back to that, um, let me jump back to that, that yard that has so much lawn, is it all being used? Likely not. So you can cut out areas and it's really a good idea to start along the edges because if you look at this, let me go to the next. Here's the front view um, showing that same transformation. A lot of these beds are along the edge of the property and that's really important thinking back to the clean water aspect of it, trying to manage that storm water and capture pollution that might be coming off that yard. These planting beds will do that. It will capture that water and give it a chance to infiltrate back into the soil. Um, and also any any fertilizers that might be coming with that storm water 
will be able to go back into these planting beds. Also, just to jump back for one second, you can see, um, let's see if I can show you with the cursor. So this is a rain garden. Going through the steps, it gives you lots of ideas, putting in a vegetable garden, a pollinator garden, um, kind of a windscreen with some evergreens. So you can get lots of ideas by going through it. Okay. And I did, did just want to show you an example of a yard where someone did just that. Um, so this is a house in uh, Island Heights, which is in Ocean County. And she had a lot of plants, but she re-landscaped, added a lot more, really reduced that area of lawn in front of her house. Um, and it's actually um, a more formal looking landscape because she didn't, she wanted to fit in with the neighborhood and she didn't want to upset any of the neighbors. Um, and she did this all with native plants. So native plants, that's what we're encouraging people to use for a variety of reasons. Um, they are adapted to our soils, to our climate, um, and to the local diseases and pests. They have natural defenses to that. They're adapted to the other animals and plants around them. They've been in our area for hundreds and hundreds of years. So why do we encourage you to go native? Well, one of the reasons is if you replace your lawn or some of your lawn with native plants, you're going to reduce um, the requirements for fertilizer, for watering, for pesticides. Um, you can actually eliminate it in many, in most cases. So two examples, the one on the left is a homeowner association clubhouse, um, Holiday City, which is in Tom's River. Um, and they, that was all an entire big lawn area in front of their clubhouse. And they wanted to install a native plant garden to show residents what they could do in their own yard and also to manage the stormwater because right behind that clubhouse is a stream, very, very close by. And then out of the picture, which you can't see in front of it, is a huge parking lot where the stormwater goes right to the stream. So they um, did this native plant garden, which was a big hit with the residents. They love it. Um, and it's managing their stormwater. And then the house on the right, that's in Pine Beach, a small yard, very sandy soil. Um, owned by Jason Austin, who is a landscaper and native plant expert. And he just decided he was tired of fighting um, with his lawn, you know, which is always having trouble with it and that dry, sandy soil. So he put all native plants, his entire lawn is native plants. So native plants, if you, the more you put in your yard, the more you're gonna make your yard a sponge. And this is because they have very, very deep roots. If you look all the way on the left of this diagram on your screen, that is showing you the comparative depth of turf grass roots. Turf grass roots, I should ask uh, Bob for a definitive answer, but I'm told that they only go down three or four inches. Even if they go down a little bit deeper than that, they do not compare to the depth of the native plant roots. And the roots, by the way, are what helps channel that storm water uh, rainwater when it hits your yard down into the soil and everything that goes down into the soil is going to replenish our aquifer which we get our drinking water from and also if there are any materials fertilizers um, whatever you know it gets it down into the soil which helps to treat it and the plants of course would uptake it now this is the one thing that I feel like a lawn, no matter how organically managed, cannot compete with um, native plants. Habitat for wildlife. Native plants are the foundation of our ecosystems. Right? They are providing all of the things that our native animals, our native wildlife needs to survive and to thrive. So by putting more native plant things, reducing your lawn size and replacing with native plants, you are going to provide very, very important habitat for these native animals. You're going to give them a refuge. You're going to hopefully, if enough people start doing this, um, it, it will be form a corridor because a lot of our habitat for wildlife now is very fragmented. You'll have houses and lawns and houses and lawns, and then a park or a patch of wood, woods, and then more houses and lawns, and it's very broken up. But if people at home start doing more of this, 
you're going to reconnect those corridors for wildlife. Um, just in case you're wondering what some of the photos are here, that's a um, native bumblebee on a butterfly weed, even though it's called a weed, it's a really beautiful plant. Um, it's in the milkweed family. And then we have our native hummingbird, the ruby throated hummingbird, um, feeding on a columbine flower. And then monarch. So we have the caterpillar. Um, the host plant is again a milkweed. It's that same butterfly weed plant. And then in the, the adult in the fall is nectaring on goldenrod. So the monarch caterpillar, as I'm sure many of you know, really can only feed on that specific species. It needs milkweed in order to feed and then be able to um, transform into the adult butterfly. So I always like to mention when we're talking about important wildlife, the insects. So over the past um, 40 years, there's been a 45% decline in our insect populations, which is actually huge because they are such an important part of our ecosystems. Um, the suspected causes, number one, cause is the loss of habitat for the insect. Also pesticide usage. Um, and then they are starting to connect a lot of the loss with some climate change impacts as well. So just, you know, you can read this list for yourself, but these are some of the ways that insects are vital, right, to our ecosystem, including to us. So before you would start doing anything to transform some of your lawn to native plant beds, um, this is step one, uh, you know, for the Jersey Friendly Yards eight steps. Um, really is important to take a little time to go out in your yard, make some observations, you know, maybe write a few things down and just do a rough sketch. It doesn't have to be, you know, fancy, just kind of showing where the structures are, um, where you have some existing beds or trees, um, you know, where the sun and shade is in different parts of the yard, uh, the places that people walk through in the yard, um, slopes, water, you know, drainage, water flow, those, those sorts of things. If you have maybe a view that you want to open up or maybe a view you want to block something in a neighbor's yard, you know, all these things you jot, jot down. And then just as uh, Bob was saying, for the lawn, same thing if you're going to do some planting. Always a good idea to get a soil test, at a minimum, the pH. Um, so this is the link to the Rucker Soil Testing Lab. Unfortunately, right now, they are not processing samples because of COVID-19, but they will reopen eventually, and um, you get a good um, report back from them. Uh, last I checked, the cost was $20. I'm not sure if it's gone up. So it's definitely a bargain, and you can just go to the website and they tell you exactly what to do and you can mail it in. So you don't even have to leave home. The thing about function, again, that's just like, do you want to plant anything for a specific reason in your yard? Do you have a sunny side of the house? You wanna have some more shade? Um, do you wanna block a view? Things like that. The next thing you would wanna do is mark out the new bed. Do you wanna get an idea of the size, the shape, so we recommend, you know, using maybe a garden hose or just some rope or twine or even, you know, some lime just to mark it out. And of course, you know, you can make it any size shape that you want. But if you remember back to that interactive yard, um, when you make it kind of flowing, curving lines along the beds, it makes it look more natural. Now comes the hard part. <laughs> if you are starting a new bed in an area where you don't have lawn, not as much of a problem as if you need to remove the turf first. So there are three basic methods. Um, obviously you can remove it by hand, which is a pretty tough job, but for a smaller area, it might, it, it's probably the quickest way to easiest, cheapest way to do it. Um, if you have a larger area, you could use a sod cutter. Um, these are the guys who put that garden in at the Holiday City Clubhouse. They definitely needed the sod cutter. And, you know, they cut it and rolled it up and actually donated it to residents um, so that it didn't get wasted. Who wanted to put sod down in their own yards. Um, 
disadvantage, you're going to lose some topsoil, you're going to lose some of that organic material when you remove it. Um, you can you can get a tiller either if you have one or you could rent a tiller. Um, that way you're turning in the grass. Uh, you're not losing that organic material, but the disadvantage is you're turning everything up. You're going to bring some weed seeds up to the surface and you're also going to disrupt some of that soil structure. Um, soil kind of naturally clumps together into aggregates. And when you use a tiller, you're busting up those aggregates, um, smoothing out the soil particles so that then if it's left um, not planted quickly enough and, and you get a heavy rain, all of that rain can compact the soil down. And then you're losing the very important pores that air spaces that are in soil. Um, that soil compaction is a serious problem and tilling can sometimes aggravate it. Or you can do method number three, which is try composting in place. And the only disadvantage to that really is that you have to think ahead, plan ahead and give yourself a few months and show you kind of the steps to that. So you're really letting nature do the work if you do this kind of uh, lasagna composting. Um, you, one suggestion is to do it in the fall. You could you could obviously start now, but you would have to wait till the following spring. Um, but if you start in the fall, um, that's a good time. Um, what you're basically doing is covering the area with overlapping layers of either cardboard or newspaper. Um, you want to wet it down really well. Um, if you do have the grass, mow it down you know, as low as possible first before you start. Um, then you're going to do alternating layers, just as if you're uh, building a compost pile, alternating layers of green and brown material. So green are things like grass clippings, uh, kitchen scraps, you know, manure, and brown if you have leaves in your yard or you can buy bales of straw, you know, anything that you can collect that's more of that brown material. Alternate the layers. And then you can finish the top. When you're done building your layers, you can put either compost or mulch on top. So this is just a diagram kind of showing you how that works. You're alternating layers. Um, sometimes it's a good idea to put the first layer as branches or you know some twigs crisscrossing, and that helps with drainage. But you don't have to do that. So this kind of composting, lasagna composting, has many benefits um it really these are some of the steps from jersey friendly yards and and how this ties into it um you are not tilling so you are going to end up with healthier soil with those a lot of air spaces it's going to be very easy to work you know at the end when it's decomposed and ready to plant uh, fertilize less you are really going to reduce or maybe eliminate the need to fertilize because you have created nutrient-rich compost by doing this Ditto on watering. Compost is very, very good at retaining water and keeps the plant roots nice and moist. Um, and healthy soil, just as you know, Bob said for, for turf grass, very important to have healthy soil for healthy um, plants. Same thing with any plant you put in your um, garden. So this is just a quick example of an area that was done. This is a park in Ocean County called Jake's Branch. And they wanted to um, build a new native plant um, demonstration garden. So they mowed down the area and then first they placed, you know, cardboard on top. They did the lasagna method. Then they did some green and brown layers. And this is the photo on the right is they mulched it at the end to make it look nice. They did this in the fall. And then the following spring, they came out uh, to, to plant it. And I've personally seen it and I'm, if you put a shovel in there and it's like butter, it's very, very soft and rich. Um, so if you have the time and, and to do this, I, I would really recommend trying it. So now I'm going to try to switch over to the Jersey Friendly Yards website. So bear with me for a minute. Just make sure that you um switch the screen share to like either sharing your own whole screen or the um or the internet application right now we don't see anything right okay
should be coming. Let yep. me know. Okay, good, good. All right, so um, so you've prepared your bed. Um, you just you know planned it out, decided where it will go. You know maybe did your lasagna or maybe pulled up some some of the the sod. You're ready to plant. Um, so the Jersey Friendly Arts website has a very awesome plant database. It is a good place to search for the right plant for the right place because it's very important to find um, plants that match the conditions. Again, that relates back to your soil tests and everything you looked at in your yard, how much sun and shade and all of that. So the database, I'm gonna scroll down a little bit, has over 300 and 50 different plants in it. The majority of them are native plants. I do wanna mention that there are some non-natives in there, um, which we decided to do back when to give people a few options, um, especially with annual plants. So it starts out on the left, you will see all of the plants in alphabetical order, all 350 of them. And then you will use these search filters to narrow down your list. So New Jersey divided into four main physiographic regions. So for this example, I usually do coastal plain, but I think I'll try Piedmont. Also, let me know if you know if I'm running out of time. I'll I'll try to speed this up a little bit. There's two special eco regions which we're not going to use today. Um, then plant type. So I do want to mention, you know. People have different size yards and you might not be able to to put in a tree if you don't have room for a tree. Um, I highly recommend, though, if you do have the room to do different types of vegetation and not just focus on the flowering perennials, but think about putting in, you know, a tree, a few trees, <laughs> shrub, a few shrubs, um, mix it up a little, some grasses, um, because it's it's more like a natural habitat to have all of these. And also, um, native plants are very important sources of insect food. Um, we had talked about the importance of insects um, for things like birds. They need a chickadee, a pear, for example, um, uses between six and 9,000 um, caterpillars to feed its young and have a successful clutch. So that that is a lot of caterpillars. And caterpillars are actually specialists who, a lot of them, most of them, the majority of them actually, um, that need a specific native plant in order to, you know, feed and survive. Um, so if we want our wildlife to survive, we need to think about putting in native plants and throwing in some trees if we can. Um, the number one tree supporting caterpillars is the oak tree family over 500 different types of caterpillar feed on on oak leaves so you know as much as we see them everywhere in new jersey they are a super important tree but um there are many shrubs grasses you know so i just suggest people mix it up a little bit so for this example let's let's try shrubs you can choose native plants only so if you notice every time i do this the, the list narrows down more and more. You can pick a particular type of wildlife that you might want to attract to your yard. Um, maybe we'll do birds, try that. But you don't have to, you know, you can keep, keep it much broader. Um, I know deer resistance is a very, very big problem for a lot of people in New Jersey. Um, if you select high, you are going to see, you're going to narrow. So see what we end up with. And then your light requirements, this is really important and that, you know, you've done that by looking at your yard. Let's go with full sun. Your soil type. I am just going to pick loam for this example, but that would come from your soil test or you probably have a pretty good idea of your soil type where you live. Um, I'm going to do slightly acidic for the soil, but again, that would come from your soil test. 
And you can see the numbers have dropped, right? We started out with 350 plants and now we're really getting down um, to a manageable list. Drought tolerance, we'll just say medium. And I think I will stop there, but you know, there are a lot of different filters. If you live, uh, you know, on a barrier island, coastal area where they get some tidal flooding or salt spray, you would wanna look at the salt tolerance. And then if you scroll back up to the top, you'll, you can see exactly what you've selected for your list. And maybe somewhere along the line, you change your mind, you can X any of these out and the list will you know, change again. So here are you know, what we have come up with from what we chose when we were searching. So then what you can do, let's try Blueberry. So you click on the name of the plant and there's a whole page of details about it. Some more photos, a description, you know, and everything, every um, every detail about that particular plant. And one that really isn't in the search filter that you would want to look at if you scroll down is the growth rate and the size. Size is really important when you're planting your planting area. You want to know what the mature size is going to be. Um, another general rule is you want to put the larger, the plants that will be larger towards the back of a bed, unless it's the kind of a bed you can walk around the entire thing, then you might want to put them in the center. But you want to be able to see, you don't want to put the larger plants in front and the smaller plants in back. A lot of it's common sense. Um, so that is important information. And you can go back to your list. So let's say one of these, you really like this. So you're looking at your list and you're like, wow, I'd really like to have some smooth sumac in my yard. So you click on this wheelbarrow and it will be added to your list. So I already logged in so that you could see this, but you can, um, first time you go on, you can register or sign in. Um, and then every time you do this, you know, you can click on your wheelbarrow and it will automatically be thrown into your plant list. I'm not going to click on that right now because when I tried it earlier, it took a really long time to get back out of it and I don't want to waste that time, but maybe at the end I'll go back and show you. Um, you can print that list out and it has like a small picture of the plant and some of the information about it. Good to have, you know, when you're going to go to the nursery and look for plants. And I know that was a question that came in. So I just want to show you that there is a page on the website um, with information about where to buy them. So it's listed by county, but there also are quite a few um, that you can order and have the plant shipped to you, which is really important with you know the, the crisis we're in right now. But as I go down, you'll see it's got and a lot of these nurseries, in-person nurseries right now are doing um, pre-order and pickup. So it's worth a phone call to them if you have one in your county. And sorry about that. Like, hope you're not getting dizzy, but here are some of the, I wanted to show you the online nurseries that will ship the plants to you. Um, these four are in New Jersey, all very reputable, been in business for a long time and they ship the plants. So it's worth looking at that. Also quickly, I just wanted to show you the Ask an Expert feature of the website. If you have a question about a particular plant, about gardening in general, landscaping type question, um, go to this page, type in your information, select your county, and then when you submit it, it will go to your uh, local Rutgers Cooperative Extension, the county that you picked, um, most likely the Master Gardeners, and they will email you back with an answer. So that is great. If you have a question about the website itself, um, go all the way up to the top. And if you do that, click on that, the email will come to me and I'm always glad to um, answer questions that people have. How are we doing on time? Should I stop? Um, we are approaching 1.30, so maybe- Yeah, maybe I think yeah. that's it. Uh, the rest is up to you guys, you know, go to the site. Um, 
if you click on this, you can play with the interactive yard. Um, but the database, I think, is like probably your most useful tools. There's tons of information on this on this site. And we also have a Facebook page so that when local nurseries do have a plant sale, um, we always put that information up on our Facebook page and then you can check that out too. So thanks everyone. I hope uh, I hope you get out there and do some um, happy gardening this spring. Okay, great. Um, we are going to ask you. I'm going to ask you a couple questions, and then we'll try to get out of here for one thirty. That came in. Um, somebody was talking about that their father just moved to Maryland, um, and they were wondering if. Maryland, um, or I guess an adjacent state is like close enough where, you know, your resources could work for them too. Yes, yes, yes. Not, not that many states actually have this. So we're really lucky that we do, but yeah, so it's a coastal mid Atlantic area. Most of the plants will be the same. So, yeah, I, I think in Maryland, you could definitely use this. Um, great. Now. I want to. No, maybe that was it. Oh, yeah. um, how much? Uh, no, that was a watering thing. I um, think that was it. Okay, that was easy. <laughs> um, yeah, but we had a lot of um, people saying thank you and stuff. Even some of them came directly to me, so I wanted to make sure that you know both of our speakers had that um again thanks for having hanging with us for the whole time everybody was able to stay um we will send out a follow-up email afterwards with um links to some of the resources discussed um from both of our speakers today and we hope to see you again next week um next on uh, next thursday we are going to have um presentation from two people from the Raritan Headwaters Association, one um, diving directly more into organic pest care um, for your garden um, that Bob touched on a little today as well. And then also a plant this, not that guide um, going uh, deeper in some native plants as well with um, that I think could pair really well with uh, Karen's talk today. Um, there are gonna be pictures of, you know, things um, Especially comparing natives to non natives, um, you know, suggestions and, and what to target for um, things like that. So, thank you again, and um, hope to see you guys at the following webinars. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle and Aaron.